if you are under metabolic constraints, meaning you don't have the energy, right, that all the energy in the world, you have to be efficient, that immediately forces you to start telling stories about coarse grained agents that do things, right? You don't have the energy to like Laplace's demon, you know, calculate every every possible uh, state that's going to happen, you have to, you have to coarse grain and you have to say, that is the kind of uh, creature that does things, either things that I avoid or things that I will go towards, that's a mate or food or whatever, whatever it's going to be. And so right at the base of uh, simple, very simple organisms starting to make models of agents doing things, that is the origin of uh, models of, of, of free will, basically, right? Because you see the world around you as having agency, and then you turn that on yourself and you say, wait, I have agency too. I can, I do things, right? And, and then you make decisions about what you're going to do. So all of this one, one model is to view all of those kinds of things as being driven by that early need to determine what you are and to do so and to then take actions in the most energetically efficient space possible. Right? So free will emerges when you try to simplify, tell a nice narrative about your environment. I think that's very possible. possible. Yeah. Do you think free will is an illusion? So, so you're kind of implying that it's a useful hack. Well, I'll say two things. The first thing is I think I think it's very plausible to say that any organism that's self or any agent that's self whether it's biological or, or not, any agent that self constructs under energy constraints is going to believe in free will. Well, we'll, we'll get to whether it has free will momentarily, but but I think but I think what what it definitely drives is a view of yourself and the outside world as an agential view. I think that's inescapable. So that's true for even primitive organisms. I think so. I think that's now. Now they don't have. Now obviously you have to scale down, right? So 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 they don't have the kinds of um, complex metacognition that we have. So they can do long term planning and thinking about free will and so and so on. But but the sense of agency is really useful to accomplish tasks, simple or complicated. That's right. In in all kinds of spaces, not just in in obvious three dimensional space. I mean, we're very good. That the thing is, humans are very good at detecting agency. Of, of like medium sized objects moving at medium speeds in the three dimensional world, right? We see a bowling ball and we see a mouse and we immediately know what the difference is, right? Uh, and how we're going to mostly things you can eat or get eaten by. Yeah, yeah, that's our that's our training set, right? From the time you're little, your training set is visual data on on this this like little chunk of your experience. But imagine if imagine if uh, from the time that we were born, we had innate senses of your blood chemistry. If you could feel your blood chemistry the way you can see, right? You had a high bandwidth connection and you could feel your blood chemistry and you could see, uh, you could sense all the things that your organs were doing. So your pancreas, your liver, all the things. If, if we had that, you, we would be very good at detecting intelligence in physiological space. We would know the level of intelligence that our various organs were deploying to deal with things that were coming to anticipate the stimuli to, you know, but, but we're just terrible at that. We don't, in fact, in fact, people don't even you know, you talk about intelligence of these other spaces, and a lot of people think that's just crazy because because all we're all we know is motion 